Okay, good morning, everybody. This is another uh, colloquium organized by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain, under the Severo Ochoa program. And today we will have the talk by uh, Nadine Neumeyer, and she will talk about nuclear star clusters. Uh, Dr. Neumeyer will be introduced by uh, our scientific director, Isabel Mark. Please, Isabel. Hello, thank you, Renee. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here to attend in this um, uh, Severo Ochoa colloquium. Um, it's a pleasure today to have with us Nadine uh, Noemeyer, who uh, kindly accepted our invitation. Thank you very much, Nadine, for, for accepting uh, the invitation and, uh, that I'd like to extend uh, to uh, an in-person one for the future as near as possible um, when things will be, get better. Um, Dr. Nadine Neumeyer is, uh, since 2020, uh, Liz Meitner Group Leader in, in, at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in, in Heidelberg, where she's a, a faculty member, uh, so, so she's the group leader of the Galactic Nuclear Group. She made her PhD in, in astronomy at the MPAA and the University of Heidelberg in 2007, and then she became a fellow at, at ESO in Garhin until 2010, when she became fellow at the Excellence Cluster, Origin and Structure of the Universe, universe and then as a staff member in, in 2011. In 2014, she moved uh, to, uh, to Heidelberg, where she, she's now as independent research uh, group leader at the MPIA. Since 2010, she has been lecturer and teacher at several uh, German universities like the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and uh, the University of, of Heidelberg. In addition, she has merited uh, a dozen of honors and awards, among which I'd like to, to uh, stress the um, Ernst uh, Patzer Award in 2004, the Otto Hahn Medal of the Max Planck Society in 2008, and more recently, the Lisa Meidner Excellence Program in 2020, that is a, a, an equivalent to an internal ERC. So that's um, really, really uh, very, very uh, um, impacting. The, the focus of her research are black holes and uh, the role they play in the evolution of galaxies. With her research team, she is investigating at what point in the development of a galaxy a massive black hole is formed and what conditions are necessary for this to happen. To answer the question uh, of whether all galaxies have central black holes, they systematically study those galaxies uh, that are still uh, in an early stage of development. The results of her uh, research give important insight into the evolution of galaxies and the distribution of matter in the universe. She is author of more than 130 publications in peer-reviewed journals with uh, about 4,000 citations already which makes her age uh, 33 or so. Today, as you know, she's talking about nuclear star clusters. So i um, say it again. Thank you very much, Nadine Neumeyer, for being here with us. And the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, very well. uh, thank you very much, Isabel, for this very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. And I would love to be with you in person. So I'm really looking forward to you know, coming when this is possible. Okay, so I hope that you can see my slides now. Is this correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So then, um, yeah, you, you have heard from Isabel that uh, my research focuses on black holes and how they get to the centers of galaxies. And in fact, nuclear star clusters are one of the, um, yeah, the, the key um, environments where we can look for low mass black holes in low mass galaxies. And uh, because this is a really a, fa a vast, like a fast growing field, um, my um, colleagues, Anil Seth and Torsten Böcke and, and I, we have um, written a review article on nuclear star clusters that appeared last year. And this talk is, is basically focusing on this review article, but I will also give you some updates what has happened since then. So in the background here of, of, this, of this slide, you can see the center of our own Milky Way, where you see the nuclear star cluster of our Milky Way here on the side. Uh, Rainer Schödel and his group in Granada, they're, they're doing a lot of research explicitly on, on this galactic center region. 
And I'm very happy that uh, one of Rainer's former PhD students, Paco, is now with us in Heidelberg as a postdoc, and he just uh, will start very soon a Humboldt Fellowship here. Wonderful. Okay, so let me just take you on a journey uh, to understand uh, what nuclear star clusters are and why we think they're very interesting. Okay, so just uh, here, uh, like a, a small movie where we zoom into the center of a nearby um, edge on spiral galaxy, NGC 4244, um, that has um, a very dense bright nucleus at the center. And here, when we switch from SDSS to HST resolution, you can see the nuclear cluster appearing in this edge on galaxy quite disky and extended. And, um, and this really shows you that you do need very high spatial resolution to resolve these clusters. So HST was instrumental to find these Why do we think nuclear star clusters are interesting? And this is basically taking away the conclusion of my talk, but I will walk you through all of these points and hope to convince you on the way that they are really interesting objects. So I will show you that these are in fact the densest stellar systems in the universe. Uh, they record, they give a record of the nuclear mass accretion. So um, whenever things are accreted onto a black hole, the information is lost, but when you accrete stars and gas onto the center of a galaxy and you have star formation from that gas, you can see when this happened, when these stars formed. So it's basically kind of an, an imprint of when the material fell there and when it formed stars. Um, they form from and sometimes also return to globular clusters. So there is a, a connection there. I will give you more insights during the talk. And then um, there are very common objects. They're actually present in the majority of massive galaxies. And I will show you the mass dependence of where, where they're most common also. And then uh, there is a, a very strong connection to massive black holes. And we can detect uh, black holes inside nuclear star clusters. And in the most massive galaxies, when we do not have nuclear star clusters anymore because they are disrupted through the merging pr um, processes of the most massive black holes, they do get, uh, they do dis dissolve, they help in the merging of the central black holes. And, and we think they're expelled in this process, but they can speed up that process of the of the black hole merger. So just to, to kind of um, uh, sketch a little bit how we think nuclear star clusters uh, form, just to set a bit of the basis, because it, it will help you to understand the rest of the talk. There are basi basically two competing formation scenarios, but they're not really competing. They're kind of also can work hand in hand. And on the one side, we have that we have a star cluster info. So um, globular clusters can fall into the centers of galaxies and, and merge and, and form a more massive um, cluster there. On the other side, we have in situ star formation at the center. So stars can form from infalling gas, retain a lot of angular momentum also. So you, this would produce a quite high uh, rotation signature. This is in situ formation. And we do see basically signs of those processes um, also in, in, in observations. It's quite some evidence that we do have cluster infall that you see here now at the center of this nearby galaxy 4654, where in HST resolution, you can resolve two star clusters very close to the center here with very little separation of only 24 parsec. And then um, the other side, you do have um, lots of young star formation at the centers of some of these galaxies. So stars do form in situ there. In the Milky Way, we do also see a combination of these two processes. And, and this is what we think is likely um, what is happening, that it's a combination of the two processes. And we would like to figure out when one process or the other is more common. So this is something we have investigated also when writing this review article. So the outline of my talk is as follow. Uh, so I will, I will show you where we find nuclear star clusters, what are their properties in terms of sizes, masses, shapes, and densities, then also stellar populations and kinematics. And then um, I will show you what their scaling relations are and also the connection to black holes and what is the connection to globular clusters that I alluded to um, before. 
Okay, so where do we find nuclear star clusters? So we do find them basically in all sorts of, of nearby galaxies. Here is a very nearby example, NGC 300. Um, it's at only two megaparsec. That's why we have a really good view at the center with HST resolution. We can resolve this very compact and massive star cluster at the center. And uh, then when we look at the surface brightness profile, we see that the nucleus uh, stands out by several magnitudes here, five magnitudes above the surface brightness of the underlying disk. So this is really a very distinct component. At the beginning, people thought that these may actually be small bulges, but they're not. They're much more compact, much more dense than, than bulges. So they do also um, appear in, in bulgeless disks. Basically, you have a pure exponential disk, and then you have a cluster that it sticks um, out of this disk like a sore thumb, actually. So here, uh, a, a bit of a different, this is the same galaxy, NGC 300, a bit of different um, pr presentation here with the log radius surface brightness. So you see it's actually popping out here, but we also see them in elliptical galaxies. It's a bit more difficult sometimes to do um, discriminate because the surface brightness in ellipticals can already be quite high. So to see something above the surface brightness of the galaxy body may be a bit more tricky, but you do see them. This is the, the neighboring galaxy of the Andromeda, also very nearby, uh, where you see the nucleus here very well. OK, uh, so these uh, figures are directly taken from the review article. But um, I also want to say that this is based on very many years of, uh, of studies. So we have really compiled the entire literature. And, um, um, and we, we want to, I want to point out that um, these uh, nuclear clusters are detected in about 50 to 75% of all galaxies. And this is, as I said, um, been shown with the Hubble Space Telescope. They sit at the very center of the galaxy, so um, at the photometric center, but uh, we could show from kinematics, studying their kinematics, that they also sh sit at the kinematic center. So here is a, a, just a subsample of, of a sample of late type spirals from Torsten Böcker that we studied with H-alpha kinematics. And you see that um, the center of the nuclear cluster is coincident with the center of the kinematics. When we compare the nuclear clusters with other globular clusters in the galaxy, and this is now um, from a, the Virgo um, galaxy cluster, um, you see uh, that all of the Virgo nuclear star clusters of Virgo galaxies that we know, they're here um, from, um, they're here plotted as a function of the galactocentric radius together with all Virgo globular clusters. So you see that nuclear clusters always sit at the very center of the galaxy. So this is now just kind of taken all of the Virgo galaxies and, and sorting where their clusters sit. The nucleus always sits at the very center, um, but the nuclear star cluster is on average around two magnitudes or even more brighter than the, your general globular cluster. Uh, which you can see here very well. But then when we sort them by galaxy, and now we sort them by galaxy mass. So here on the x-axis, you now have the individual masses of the, the Virgo galaxies and their associated globular cluster population. You, so, you do see that the nuclear star cluster is always the brightest uh, cluster in a particular galaxy. So, and, and when you see, uh, look at this, um, the difference between the brightest globular cluster and the nuclear cluster gets larger when you go to higher masses. And this also shows you that there is something going on with the growth of the nuclear cluster. At the low masses, there may actually be just the, the highest mass or brightest end of the globular cluster population, but then they definitely grow to larger masses in the more massive galaxies. Okay, so this is now only for a Virgo cluster, but we have looked really at the entire literature, compiled all the data sets here, and looked which galaxies actually do host nuclear clusters and which galaxies may actually not host nuclear clusters. So look at the fraction of nucleation of galaxies. And we did this uh, both for spirals, but also for ellipticals. And then uh, the early and late type 
well, we it's it's difficult to to sort them by morphology, so we sorted them basically by color. So this is a color cut now here, um, and um, and you see here um, the early types, uh, the sorry, the early types here in the red type galaxies, and the late types, and um, and here at the fraction of galaxies that host a nuclear star cluster as a function of host galaxy stellar mass. And you see that it's quite low at the low mass end. So here, as you see, there are very many um, white circles, which means there are no detected nuclear star clusters and only few of the filled circles. So here, the fraction of nucleated galaxies is really low, but it rises up to about 80% here at a host galaxy stellar mass of about 10 to the 9. So not all of those galaxies has, have nuclear clusters, but the vast majority. So these are very common objects. And then it drops again. So this drop here at the very high mass end, we think is um, the interaction with the massive black hole at the center in galaxy mergers that build up the more massive galaxies. Um, but then this drop here is probably due to the ability of those galaxies to form very massive star clusters to begin with as the seeds for the nuclear clusters. And, and this has been the state last uh, last year. And we, we noticed that there are not so many um, late type galaxies here observed, like the, uh, the situation in the, in the cluster, galaxy clusters like Virgo and Fornax and Coma is much better. So there are many studies on the, on the early types, but not so many on the late types. So we looked in the local volume, and this is work led by um, a student of mine, uh, Niels Hoyer, and he actually uh, digged through the entire Hubble Space Telescope archive to to fill in, you know, what's the nucleation fraction in the local volume as you know a proxy for the for a lower density environment. And this is what he found. And this is following up a work uh, led by Ruben Sanchez Janssen, who has shown this uh, work for the for the Virgo cluster, where you see the nucleation fraction as a function of of galaxy mass, host galaxy stellar mass again, um, for the different environments. So um, Sanchez Janssen et al, they already had put this down for Virgo, um, Fornax and Coma, but now Niels Hoyer um, has added the local volume and you see that there may be actually a trend with, with density of the environment. So that denser environments, they have a higher nucleation fraction at the same galaxy stellar mass, but altogether they do peak at around a galaxy stellar mass of between 9 and 9.5, and then they drop again. And uh, this is um, following up of the, the difference between the early and late types. Um, so the, as I said, in the, in the galaxy clusters, this is predominantly early type galaxies. And so this is this red curve with the stars. Um, and then for the local volume, we can do the separation a bit better with the early and late types. And you see that they do have a lower nucleation fraction than the cluster environment. And it, it looks like they're following each other quite well. It's, so it's not, the, the difference is not between early and late type, but it's more between the environment that, that plays a role here. And we still try to figure out what is, what is causing this. So this is still work in progress. Okay, so get a bit back to the properties of nuclear clusters. Um, so what are their sizes, their typical sizes? So this is um, um, compiling work from um, Pat Cote and also Georgiev and Böker um, for early and, and late types. And um, here you see the distribution of, of, of the sizes, the typical effective radii of nuclear star clusters. So you see that the typical nuclear star cluster size is between three and five parsecs. So it's around about the same as a globular cluster. The Milky Way uh, nuclear star cluster has an effective radius of about four to seven parsec. This is the, the value quoted from Schödel et al. 2014. And then um, we can also look at their shapes, you know, whether, you know, they are more flattened or rounder. And we thought that we could find um, some difference between early and late types, but it's actually not so, not so obvious. So the ellipticity, of course, it also depends on the viewing angle that you see um, the, um, the galaxy uh, on. And so the Milky Way here, 
has an ellipticity of, of 0 0.29. So it, it appears to be um, actually um, quite round, although um, we see its edge on, but it is a little bit flattened. Okay, then the masses, I would like to just tell you, you know, more or less how, how massive nuclear star clusters are. And here, in comparison to globular clusters, I told you they have more or less the same size, but uh, nuclear star clusters are brighter, and that's why they're also more massive than your typical globular cluster. So this is the, uh, the mass distribution, and here is um, the masses for the more massive host galaxies here in field green, and here as a comparison, the Milky Way globular clusters in gray. So you see um, your average nuclear cluster would be between six, uh, 10 to the six and 10 to the seven solar masses, while um, the globular clusters, they peak at around 10 to the five. So we have at least one or even more orders of magnitudes more mass in a typical nuclear cluster. But there definitely is also overlap between the masses or to globular clusters. Again, for comparison, the Milky Way has um, a mass of about three times 10 to the seven. So it's here on the on the more massive side because the Milky Way is also a quite massive galaxy. Then there is a relation between the, the mass of the nuclear cluster and the mass of the host galaxy. Um, and it looks like it's a, it's a pretty you know, linear relation, but it, it has a, a kink here at the highest masses. And so th this is again at a, at a mass of about 10 to the 9-ish or so where um, the nucleation peaks and where we think also there are more massive uh, nuclei compared to their host galaxies. When you do um, the comparison, you, you um, take the ratio of nuclear cluster mass over host galaxy mass as a function of host galaxy mass. You see that in lower mass galaxies, nuclear clusters do dominate here. They, they have a higher mass fraction than it, it's going down. So, and this is the same, it's true both for, for early and late types, um, but there seems to be something, you know, that makes it maybe turn back in the, in the late types um, at the highest masses. So, um, yeah, there is a picture emerging that something happens at this um, mass of 10 to the 9, and, and it's even getting more obvious when we look at the stellar populations. But here, um, just going back, um, combining the masses with the radii actually uh, brings me to the densities because I, I told you nuclear clusters are the densest stellar systems that we have in the universe. And we see this here, there is the effective radius versus mass relation. Um, here, basically, um, uh, nuclear clusters on top of the globular clusters here in the background. And here you ha do have um, galaxies um, here that are, of course, larger, but also more massive. But then when you, when you look at the surface mass density versus object mass, um, here you have, again, uh, galaxies, you have um, compact ellipticals and, and ultra compact dwarf galaxies here in between. But nuclear star clusters, they sit here at masses between 10 to the 6 and a few times 10 to the 8 with the highest densities that you can find because they are so small and they have such high masses. So they are more dense than your typical globular cluster and, and yeah, have similar yeah, radii. So higher masses, smaller, uh, same radii, um, that's why they have higher densities. And this is quite interesting because um, it also tells you that you have very many stars very close to the center of these objects. So that's why we think they're excellent, excellent targets to look for low mass black holes in the centers because you will have an imprint, a dynamical imprint on the motion of the stars very close to the center. That's why we use them as tracers for detecting black holes in these low mass galaxies. Okay, so I, I said that they're the, uh, the objects with the highest stellar densities and maybe they are even the progenitors of massive black holes because you will have um, runaway collisions of stars and, and that could, could lead to the formation of, of massive black holes. Um, 
for some of the targets, um, we could even get uh, resolved uh, density profiles. And this is now a study um, by um, Renuka Pecetti, um, who, who was looking at HST data combined with extruder and genius spectra to, to model um, also the velocity dispersion of these galaxies and, and look at the, the densities here of these, um, of these galaxies, um, of these nuclear star clusters. And um, interestingly, um, you can, or you, you see more or less a trend with galaxy mass is that all these redder, the more massive galaxies that seem to have higher densities. And you do see basically the density profiles more or less go parallel. In um, this is now the three-dimensional density. So this is because it's involved modeling of the, of the images. Um, that's why it's basically um, deprojected. So this is very interesting uh, in a 3D sense. And the best comparison um, object is, is the Milky Way again. Um, and here we have, of course, even better resolution. So this is at a resolution or at a scale of about uh, 0.01 parsec. So it would be really here off the chart. Uh, the Milky Way has a, a density of above 10 to the seven solar masses per cubic parsec. So really is, is very, very high density at the very center. So there is interaction of course with the nuclear star cluster stars and the, and the massive black hole at the center. And so now I would like to go a little bit, um, talk about the stellar population. So what we know about uh, the stars that sit in nuclear star clusters. And as I already told you, there is now evidence for a systematic change in stellar populations with mass. So um, when we look at the, um, the higher mass galaxies, so galaxies with stellar masses of above 10 to the nine solar masses, the nuclear clusters typically have a metallicities of about of above minus one, and they often have very young populations. So there is gas accretion and um, star formation from recycled gas. So uh, they have higher um, metallicities. At the low mass on the other side, so um, galaxies with stellar masses below 10 to the nine, they seem to have dominant old metal poor populations at the at the centers and um, even lower metallicities than the surrounding host galaxy body. So what we think is that the nuclei there, they form from uh, accreted globular clusters that, that formed from the first episode of star formation in those galaxies from very metal poor gas. And then um, while in the disk, there may have been some gas left that formed second generation or yeah other generation stars, then um, you, you could um, then um, have uh, those in spiraling globular cluster retain the uh, metal metallicity of the first burst of star formation at very low metallicity. And we compiled uh, that evidence from the literature. And this has been one of the, um, the most exciting plots I think that emerged from our review is um, that really at this, um, this is now metallicity of the nuclear star cluster against the host system stellar mass again. And, and we see that at a, a mass of the host galaxy of, of about 10 to the nine solar masses, you do have a switch between nuclei that can be more metal poor than their average um, metallicity of the host galaxy. And these lines are the mass metallicity relations here for low mass from Kirby and for the higher mass objects from Galazzi et al. And, um, and you see that here at lower masses, sometimes nuclei have lower metallicities than the surrounding host galaxy um, stellar body. And here above 10 to the nine, all nuclei that, that are, have been studied are more metal rich than the surrounding galaxy. So there is definitely in situ growth going on in these galaxies. That's why probably they also appear to be more, um, yeah, um, more massive relative to the host galaxy. And this is when we now um, subtract uh, the mass metallicity relation basically. So it's in fact more or less showing the same thing. It may be not as clear, but yeah, it's, it's the same. 
type of data. And this has now been followed up. It's quite exciting that there is so much uh, progress in this. Uh, recent work by Katja Farion shows from the uh, Fornax 3D survey that uh, basically here metallicity again ag against now this is the mass of the object. So this is the mass of the galaxies here. These are the, the galaxies. Um, and color coded by age. So you see this again, the mass metallicity relation of these galaxies. And then adding uh, nuclear clusters and globular clusters, you can see that some of the nuclear clusters, uh, they're actually quite massive. And uh, they are also, um, some of them are quite old, some are in fact quite young, but they, they all have pretty high metallicities here at the high mass end. And they do merge with the globular cluster population at the, at the lower masses and also lower metallicities. So some of the nuclear clusters, they have very, very low metallicities, the lowest mass ones, basically. So there has not been a lot of gas um, accretion probably left to, to um, um, enrich the stellar populations of these nuclei with, with higher metals. So the picture that, uh, that Katja Farion drew in her paper is exactly also in line with what we, what we have proposed in the, in the review, is that basically at 10 to the nine solar masses, um, you have this um, dividing line between the formation scenario of globular cluster um, in spiral here at the one side um, for the low mass systems and here central star formation at the high mass. But of course, there is also, you know, you will have a transition where you have both, um, both mechanisms working hand in hand here in this transition region. So this is really nice. But in um, this extended star formation histories, they are actually the norm. So they're, they're there, you know, it's not that you form this thing at an instance and then, then it's there sitting in isolation because you do sit at the center of the potential well of a galaxy. So there is a lot happening there. So nuclear clusters basically all show extended star formation histories. This is from a work of my previous uh, postdoc of my former postdoc Nikolai Kacharov and it's um, also been shown by other people that you do need um, stellar population of different ages and metallicities to, to explain or to model the spectra of nuclear star clusters. And we also know that extended star formation history is very important for the Milky Way center. So the majority of the mass is pr pretty old, but you do have bursts of younger star formation on top of this also. And this is beautiful work by Paco and uh, from the Galactic Nucleus Survey led by Rainer. Okay. So looking into our nearby uh, universe and into a number of very beautiful, um, pure spiral galaxies, we can uh, study um, quite a number of things. So all of these uh, galaxies, um, they host pretty nuclear star clusters. And in a program with HST with seven filters here, photometry, um, we looked at uh, the um, shapes and also stellar populations of these galaxies. <clears throat> and one thing, that we found was that um, when you sort them um, by, by um, wavelength, basically, you do see that uh, the cluster sizes increases with the filter wavelength. So it looks like the redder stars are more extended and the bluer stars are more centrally concentrated. And the interpretation is that the young stars, they're more centrally concentrated. Also the stars, they may actually form more central and the old component is more spatially extended and rounder. And uh, again, the Milky Way helps us to really resolve this into individual stars because it, it's our most nearby galactic nucleus. And uh, this is work um, that's been led by my former PhD student, Anja Feldmeier, Feldmeier Krause, um, where she analyzed both ISAG data, a long slit scan with ISAG here in this green boxes, and also KMOS data. In the background, you see a image, a grayscale image of the VVV survey. And, and you see here the blue stars, they're um, the young stars, and the other colored stars are older stars. And you see also here in the Milky Way, we do find uh, the young stars centrally concentrated. And this has been known for a while, but but the work of Anya really showed that there are no stars really 
that not the majority of stars have been missing here in our large, um, larger scan uh, field is really, we, we would have seen if there would be really many more young stars because it's quite tricky actually to detect young stars here in the in the galactic center because you are bound to near infrared wavelength and from photometry alone it's it's very very difficult to identify young stars from a jhk photometry in this region and i think Paco may have told you much more about this. So from, from this work, we not only got um, individual stellar spectra, but also a um, velocity map of the central region of the Milky Way. And uh, this is um, really very nice because for the first time we can see in, the, in a map type of way how the stars um, circle around the center of the Milky Way. So the red side is going away from us and the blue side is coming towards us. And with this data set, because we know that there is a black hole sitting here at the very center, we can also start and test um, the black hole mass models that we use for external galaxies. And I just want to spend a minute on how, how we actually do that. So when you want to measure a black hole mass, um, you have several requirements, right? You need a dynamical tracer to, to uh, trace the, the motion of, of the un invisible mass of the black hole. Um, the influence of, of the black hole, you, you trace it on, on your secondary body, uh, gas or stars. And then you need to resolve the region where the black hole, in fact, influences or dominates the, the gravitational potential. And then thirdly, you need a dynamical model that takes into account the gravitational potential of the stars, because the stars, they do accumulate mass quite drastically. And, um, and then you, you need to take that into account. And of course, the, the mass of the putative, the potential black hole. And so um, Anya's work here has put together the first two dimensional maps of the motions of stars around the center of the Milky Way. So here we have the line of sight motion. And here we have the velocity dispersion of the data. You directly see the region where the black hole dominates the potential as the region here the in, in, the, in the Milky Way center, it's about one parsec radius. And uh, you see this at this elevated velocity dispersion measurements. Um, the cross is where the black hole sits. So this is the peak in velocity dispersion. But now we can use the same type of dynamical model that we can, we typically use also for external galaxies because they're only these kind of uh, measurements are possible and we super well resolved the, the sphere of influence here and um, this is a now a Schwarzschild dynamical model so an orbit superposition model that predicts the mass of the black hole to be uh, three times 10 to the six solar masses so you see it's a little bit lower than the canonical value of four million solar masses that we know from resolved stars but within the uncertainties that are definitely larger in this type of modeling, um, it, it fully agrees. So I think this is really a, a very unique validation of the models that we use for external galaxies. Okay, so having the kinematics is really great because it can also show you, tell us something about the formation of nuclear clusters because here um, it's, it's rotating pretty rapidly. And it looks like also other nuclear star clusters typically rotate. So here is the Milky Way in comparison to, to other galaxies. This is 4244, the galaxy that you've seen at the very beginning in this movie. It's the edge-on example. So it also rotates pretty, pretty well. Um, this is a nearby um, early type, NGC 404, and an early type in the Fornax galaxy cluster, FCC 47, um, that, that is actually a very massive galaxy. So it actually ha also has quite rapid rotation. So you see more or less even this, this low mass elliptical, it, it, ro it shows rotation, a bit more complex kinematics, maybe, but we can compare the rotational signature to the velocity dispersion and get an idea of what's the rotational support um, of the stars in this centers of this galaxy. This is the V over sigma versus epsilon uh, plot. And, and when we compiled this um, last year, we figured out that 
<coughs> sorry, that uh, there were very few um, late time galaxies here in this plot. We had the data and finally now um, my postdoc Francesca Pina has, has filled in this plot with many more uh, spiral galaxies. And it, it's quite nice to see that the spirals, of course, as you may um, yeah, expect, they do show higher degree of rotation versus um, dispersion. Um, M32 is actually quite high up here. So um, it, it may tell you something about maybe this is um, the leftover of a nucleus that, that came from a uh, more um, spiral-like galaxy because it had an interaction with the Andromeda galaxy in the past. So this kind of um, yeah, information is also hidden in the kinematics, but it's, yeah, it's a little bit more uncertain, but it's definitely very, very interesting. Okay, so what else can the kinematics tell you? I, I told you that we are looking for black holes in these nuclear clusters, and this is basically what I want to um, end with the talk, is the, ne the next 10 minutes will be dedicated to black holes and how nuclear clusters can help us there. So <clears throat> these low mass galaxies, they do host nuclear clusters, but also uh, black holes. And here the Milky Way center in comparison to our yeah, more nearby uh, spiral galaxies. And, and um, this is a very nice example of an, an AGN, it's 4395, NGC 4395, where from gas kinematics, we could um, get a black hole mass of around four times 10 to the five solar masses, so in an order of magnitude lower than in the Milky Way. And here um, in this nearby galaxy, NGC 7793, it's also pure spiral galaxy. We, we also um, kind of think we do uh, get close to a detection of a black hole. So we have an entire sample that is um, putting, uh, yeah, spanning a parameter space of very nearby galaxies because we need to resolve the sphere of influence of the black hole. And we cover only very low mass galaxies because we think they're very interesting to probe because we want to see at which point of the evolution in the galaxy you already find massive black holes. And we do find black holes in all of these galaxies that I actually have encircled here. This is uh, at the moment an upper limit. But even in this um, very low mass galaxy, NGC 205, we, we push the limit to a black hole detection. We do not find signs here. And we, we have not analyzed the others because the data in these low surface brightness objects is, is very challenging to in fact resolve the kinematics. So in seven of the nine hosts that we have uh, already uh, studied, we do find a compact center at the, at the, a compact object at the center of the galaxy. And then um, this is um, compared to other literature data um, where nuclear star clusters and black holes coexist, again, um, as a function of host galaxy um, stellar mass. We do see that um, um, here you, you have first more or less a plateau of the same fraction, more or less, of black hole mass to nuclear cluster mass, but then um, the black holes uh, pick up and, and they do dominate the central potential of those galaxies. And at some point, nuclear clusters disappear in galaxy centers. And here, um, it's the black hole mass to the nuclear cluster mass as a function of the nuclear cluster mass. And here we have added a few objects that are called ultra compact dwarf galaxies. And this is a very interesting um, category because ultra compact dwarfs, they have often they, they have thought to be either the high mass end of the globular cluster mass sequence or stripped off galaxy centers. And the fact that we do find very massive black holes in those objects actually makes us believe, and together with the fact that they are having very extended star formation histories, that those objects are in fact stripped off nuclear clusters. And this brings me to the point where we think like, they may actually form from globular clusters, that, but they may also end up as globular clusters, as the highest mass globular clusters in, their, in, in other galaxies. So when I ask you which of those galaxies in this image is the densest galaxy 
used to be the densest galaxy in the universe when it was um, found, when it was identified, you may have not even picked up this very small dot here in this image, but this is used to be the densest galaxy. And when we look at the kinematics of the stars here, the motion of the stars, they reveal the presence of a massive black hole here at the center. So the stars actually rotate very nicely, but they also do show a very high enhanced peak of velocity dispersion. And modeling this again with the Schwarzschild superposition, orbit superposition method, reveals a black hole mass of about two times 10 to the seven solar masses. And this is enormous black hole for this tiny galaxy because the black hole makes up about 15% of the UCD's mass, of the entire mass of the galaxy. And <clears throat> this is crazy because usually they make up about 0.5% or so of the galaxy mass. But when you compare, for example, for the Milky Way, the mass of the central black hole of 4 million solar masses to the nuclear star cluster of 3 times 10 to the 7, so 30 million solar masses, you have exactly the same mass ratio. So this is what we believe happens here, is that you have a stripped off nucleus of a galaxy in this massive body of M60. So here, and body simulations of Holger Baumgart, they show that when you have this nucleated galaxy and you throw it into this massive elliptical in the Virgo cluster, um, you strip off the more loosely bound stars. Do you see this actually? I think so. <laughs> and and you, you strip it off and you do you, you are left with, in the end, with only the very tightly bound stars in the nucleus that sit in the potential well also of the black, massive black hole. And so, yeah, in simulations, you can do very nice things and you just end up where you want to be and in this outskirt of, of this very massive elliptical. And this type of processes, this, they also happen, maybe to a less extent, but they also happen around the Milky Way. So there is a very interesting um, target, which is the nucleus of the Sagittarius dwarf, M54. And it was discovered long before the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy was discovered. So M54 sits at the photometric center, of, of the Sagittarius galaxy. And we studied this galaxy, this galaxy core that is classified as a globular cluster of the Milky Way. It's actually, in fact, the second most massive globular cluster of the Milky Way. We studied it with a nice uh, program uh, with MU. So we got 16 pointings with MUs. And this has been work led by my former PhD student, Maite Alfaro Coelho, also together with um, Nikolai Kacharov and others in, in my team. And this is now a fails color image from the Muse cube. So you see um, the, the Muse data is really excellent. And we get more than uh, 6,600 stellar spectra from these, um, from these Muse pointings. And with this, we can reconstruct the formation history of M54. I can maybe go into a little bit more detail if you're interested. But at the moment, I would like to um, focus on the, on the kinematics because this is what we are, what we are doing now. So we, we are looking at um, how the different populations that we have identified in this, in this um, Milky Way globular cluster, in fact, it's a stripped of nuclear cluster, is that we have an old metal poor population that is more extended. So the young population is more metal rich um, here. This is the more metal rich population. It's, it's more centrally concentrated and um, it actually rotates faster than the old metal poor population that is more uh, dispersion dominated. So again, kind of showing the similar trends as also in the other nuclear clusters that are still in their host galaxy body. And then what we, of course, would like to find is a signature of a massive black hole. But what you see here is that the velocity dispersion, in fact, drops at the very center. And this is because of the very high crowding of stars in the center of M54. So the stars are so nearby that we cannot resolve enough stars to get the enhanced uh, signal of the velocity dispersion from these individual stars. And the integrated resolution of MUSE is too low to, um, to detect um, or to resolve the, 
um, velocity dispersion of only 20 kilometers per second here. So we are kind of lost because this is in fact exactly the, the region that we would be interested in because this is the only part that would be in, in, um, influenced by the presence of the, of the black hole here. So you have to resolve the central region and we need to resolve the central 10 arc seconds. So we need higher special resolution. But luckily, uh, MUSE has been equipped with adaptive optics. So we got data in the wide field mode plus AO. So you see it's already a bit better, but still not good enough. So we needed to focus even closer to the center. And this is now with the narrow field mode um, of MUSE and um, now at the resolution of the wide field mode AO. But when we switch on the AO for the narrow field mode, we get really superb uh, data with a, an increase of a factor of 10 of spatial resolution. So we do resolve individual stars here at the center and also do get a little bit of, a, of this of the signature, but this is work in progress. So, so Maite um, is working hard to constrain the black hole mass in this object that has been claimed to be around 10 to the four solar masses. Another cluster that we of course study is Omega Sen. We have an ongoing news program, I can tell you more things maybe when I can visit in person. But this, in fact, brings me uh, towards the end of my talk when I want to really, really thank all the great people in, in my research group. Um, um, here you see uh, the people who are still with me. Anya is now a postdoc in my group, uh, Paco, Francesca Pina, and I also had a, a great people who went on to do other things. Um, Alina is a current PhD student, uh, Max and Selina working on the Omega Sen project, and Niels uh, was uh, working on this nucleation fraction that I showed you. Okay, so with this, I would like to end my, my presentation by again putting up my conclusions that I already showed you at the beginning, why nuclear star clusters are interesting. I think they're super interesting because they're the densest stellar systems in the universe. They give you a record of the mass accretion in the nucleus of a galaxy. They form from, but also may return to globular clusters. They're present really in the majority of massive galaxies. And there is a strong connection to massive black holes. And they might actually tell us where to find the lowest mass black holes in the universe. And here is where I will end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nadine, for this wonderful talk. And now the talk is open for questions. Uh, Reiner will manage it. And uh, please raise your hand for doing that. Press the button uh, in, the, in the menu there and raise your hand. Uh, Nadine, uh, sorry, Reiner. OK. Yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vene. Nadine, this has been an incredibly good talk. I, I know personally she has had a bit, she was a bit under pressure on, on, on preparing this, and it is one of the best talks I have listened to in years. So, so really, Nadine, congratulations. I know. Thank you so much. This has been an absolutely amazing talk. Of course, I'm very close to this, but no, here's the first talk. So, yes, we have uh, Marc Barcells, I think. You can, can I unmute him or can, do you have to do this, René, the unmuting? He will, he will do it, yeah. Okay, good. Mark. Yes. Um, thanks for, for a beautiful talk. I uh, enjoyed it very much. Uh, I, I wanted to, to uh, go back to, to the very beginning where you uh, discuss um, the frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, what are the selection effects on those plots? Uh, on the fraction of galaxies that have that have nuclear star clusters, because on the on the low side, uh, because the mass of the and the size of the of the cluster scales to some degree with the with the mass and the size of the of the parent galaxy, uh, clusters are smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe maybe tricky. And mm -hmm. also on the uh, more interesting, I think, at least to me, is on, on the high mass side. Um, because galaxies then tend to have bulges, um, the surface brightness of the underlying galaxy goes up. And distinguishing whether this is just a, a single Cersic type profile going in, or there's a Cersic and a nuclear cluster, 
uh, it can be tricky. Um, so I was wondering uh, what, what was your, your idea on, on, on what, what would be the, the real underlying distribution and whether nuclear clusters just uh, are there in essentially all of the high mass galaxies, even though we don't see them because the brightness kind of merges with the, with the underlying distribution. Mm, thank you very much for this question. And yeah, and I, I know you've been one of the early players in this field. So it's very, very nice to have you here and your interest. Um, so uh, I think you're touching on a very important point is kind of, you know, how, uh, when to really call something a nuclear cluster. So, and, um, and um, selection effects that could, in fact, um, we've also said in the, in the review that these are, in fact, we believe are lower limits on the nucleation fraction because um, we, we might actually miss some nuclear clusters in the more massive galaxies because um, just we cannot discriminate them between, you know, the underlying body, as you say, and also some dusty objects like in the Carolo sample. I think the Carolo sample, in fact, although it's listed here, it's not made it into our nucleation fraction plot because it's been too difficult. Also, we didn't know the stellar masses here also for the hosts and it was tricky to, to get them. But um, it's true that probably um, in, in at least in some of those galaxies, those might be lower limits and we might actually have more galaxies. At the very high mass end um, here, we don't in fact see um, uh, we, we may be incomplete to the to the highest mass galaxies also but but there the highest mass galaxies because they do have um, quite shallow cores in the centers I think we would see nuclear clusters if if there would be there like in in objects like for example m87 or so I think there may not be the problem but those power law ellipticals may be the, the ones that, that we might be more, more concerned about. And there it's, it's a bit tricky. I don't know whether that actually is sufficient for you as an answer, but it's, um, it's definitely um, probably more a lower limit for the nucleation fraction than anything. Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. More questions, you can also use the chat. So I pitch one in, oh, Isabel. Yeah, so um, I wanted to congratulate you, Nadine. It was really a, a great, a great talk. I've learned a lot mm -hmm. and it's an amazing, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, but I calculated some amazing amount of work that you've, show, uh, you've been showing. I have a question concerning cluster galaxies. Um, uh, since they are supposed to be suffering or at least uh, some of them from processes that are uh, taking out mass from them, such so as harassment or, or so, uh, um, how can this affect uh, the position of the galaxies you're showing in, in terms of how the uh, nuclear uh, cell cluster uh, contributes, I mean, have a relative contribution to the total mass, if you are not, taking, not considering the, the total initial mass because they've suffered from mass loss. Okay, this is also a very interesting question um, regarding the buildup of the nuclei when you have mergers of galaxies, right? So this is something that we have also explore, <clears throat> explored in the in the review and and uh, and in this follow up paper. In in fact, uh, with uh, from Niels Hoyer, um, is that there have been simulations um, by Fabio Antonini, for example, that um, you know put together in mergers uh, galaxies and, and first you may disrupt the, the nucleus, but then you can rebuild it and you can rebuild it if the, um, if the, the black hole is not as dominant in the center. So you would um, rebuild a, a nuclear cluster in, in after the merger or basically the, the the nuclear cluster together with the black holes, they come in and, and they merge because they, they're the, the most massive particle, so to say, in, in that whole merger um, business. And then um, the nuclear clusters would also merge and they, they would, would be there more or less on that, on that relation. But um, in terms of the galaxy, the host galaxy, and especially the, the low mass, the dwarf type galaxies that you 
that you may throw in, you know, in into the more massive galaxies in in a in a cluster. Of course, they they will contribute to the to the outskirts of the of more massive galaxies, and their nuclei may actually hang around as as most massive globular clusters of that of that um, giant elliptical galaxy. And for example, for the Milky Way, these type of um, simulations have been done to predict how many stripped of nuclei we would have accreted over the history of the Milky Way. And in, in fact, different simulations, for example, uh, by Dietrich Kreusen, uh, one of the latest ones, show that the Milky Way has probably accreted about um, five to seven um, stripped of nuclei of galaxies. So the most prominent example is probably Omega Sen. This has been fairly early merger with the Milky Way. And uh, one of the later ones that we still see the host galaxy is M54. So there we can really see this um, in, in progress, this merger. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is very interesting because those could also bring um, black holes with them. And, and because you strip off the nucleus of a galaxy, the black hole um, is kind of starved of material to, to, be, to accrete further on. So it's basically uh, frozen in an earlier state, right? When you, when you strip off the, the host galaxy. So these objects in, in ultra compact dwarf galaxies are some of the best examples to look for really um, seed type black holes because you freeze them in a state before they can grow larger. And so they can help us to constrain the seed mass population of black holes in the universe, which is, uh, which is really an exciting topic to follow up. And they may be quite common and they may um, uh, extend or enlarge uh, the known black hole population in the, in the local universe by quite a bit actually, because these mergers are actually quite common in, in those galaxies. I may have not answered the particular question, but I hope I've given you a bit more background. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. I will ask mine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, of course, raises the very old problem of how do you get the mass to the center? This is an old AGN problem. Uh, so typically it was found you have barred mm -hmm. galaxies and, and you see that these things really start, okay, basically you have to limit our, ourselves to, to late type galaxies now where they're not globular cluster like and where you have uh, higher metallicities and more formation. So um, where does the mass come from? Do you have, okay, and the, the samples are always extremely small. So the question is, if you just limit yourself to late type galaxies, can you see anything that you need that bars play a role or have you higher fractions of bulges that may point mm -hmm. towards mergers or can it just be the stellar wind material from the center of galaxies that condenses in the middle? Yeah, very I, good I question. It's a very vague question, but of course it's interesting where, where the stuff comes from. Mm. You mean the stuff to build the nuclear cluster? Yes, to, to yeah. the yeah, generation. Yeah. I mean, you have globular cluster infall mm. maybe for a seed and, and yeah. then and yeah. where do you get the mass from and how does the mass reach the center? Yeah, it's yeah this problem from AGN also. I, I, I fully um, yeah, understand. And, and this is something we try to explore right now um, with um, um, a PhD student, Alina Böcke, that you mm -hmm. also saw on the last slide. Uh, she's, um, she's analyzing um, illustrious TNG uh, simulations at the highest um, resolutions, 50 parsec. This is still not good enough to resolve really the nuclear star cluster, but it's um, the best we can do at the moment. And what we are looking into is uh, where the material comes from that builds up this, the central 100 parsec or 500 parsec, whether it's actually coming from a region further outside or whether it's actually born there in C2. And these um, simulations, they do not resolve individual globular clusters, but at least they can, you know, particle like, uh, you know, in this n body simulation. And, and we do see that even um, XC2 particles from, from external galaxies, 
they make it into the very center of a, of a galaxy over the lifetime of, you know, of the universe. And so even XC2 particles can trigger also migration of stars. So we see that, that mergers or interactions of galaxies do trigger inward migration in the disk and also central star formation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a pretty, it's a very complex process. So we haven't actually boiled down the results. So we, we understand, you know, there is so much information in these simulations, but it's tricky to really distill it, what, whether you can, you know, because every galaxy is different, but then you, you know, you want to see physical trends and, and there are very many barred galaxies and the barred galaxies, they do have a, um, even higher um, uh, formation of the central disk and also the, the nucleus. But um, yeah, it's it's quite complex, and I hope we will come up with uh, yeah some answers over the next couple of months. Yeah. Further questions? Nope. No, no, I don't see any more questions. So I will. So thank you very much again, Nadine. Really, this, this has been a very, very nice talk. And uh, I'll give back to René now. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you, Nadine, for very nice talk. And uh, we can close the talk here. Thank you again. And of course, as Isabel told you, we are invited to come here to Granada. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. <laughs>